Good afternoon. This is Dr. Dan Guerra coming to you from Authentic Biochemistry Studios in the Inland Pacific Northwest of the United States of America. Today is the 14th of December and the year is 2021, rapidly finishing this year. Now, at the same time, the year is reaching the solstice and the earth is going to start moving in the direction so that the northern hemisphere so it's getting more proximal to the exposure to direct sun and it starts warming up and the days get longer we are going to finally finish the aging lecture we have to finish it because i'm getting old just doing it it's been a year of covering aging and what i thought first would be a month and then a couple of months just kept on going throughout the year. I think though we really saturated, um, like a saturated fatty acid maybe, um, with the information necessary to complete at least a round of discussions of the biochemistry and physiology. And then in association with that, and in the, within the dialectic, the pathobiochemistry and pathophysiology of what aging is, and I think I'm trying to convince you, and I've convinced myself anyways, that aging is a chronic disease that we take from uh, early beginning of uh, embryonic uh, differentiation and development through gestation and then <clears throat> postpartum. And then all the years from birth until the day we die, we are in a process of aging. And along the way, we accumulate certain morbidities that in some kind of non-random accumulated um, vagary against the normal physiology, we pick up enough morbidities to generate uh, the ultimate death. And what I'm going to do today is hopefully not spend a lot of time with detail but just summarize, because I'm in this now I'm in the synthetic phase of this. We did a lot of analysis, a lot of tearing apart of primary literature for a very long time. Now we're summarizing and finishing this arc of lectures. So um, for those of you that have been following along with this, I don't know how many there are. I do get numbers. And I know I don't have a huge following on the uh, video lectures. I have more, I think, on the audio on authentic biochemistry audio podcast, um, but hopefully um, this will attract more attention and that the viewers that do find this kind of uh, authentic science um, useful to them will contact me uh, via the normal channels that, that I've offered and let me know that you're interested in me continuing this and maybe uh, helping me fund these projects because I'd like to continue this because um, I feel it's important as a, basically a semi-retired um, university professor, and I taught biochemistry practically my entire uh, adult career, um, that I think that this is very useful uh, information that should be distributed far more um, directly and um, in a, throwing a larger net into everyone that might be able to understand what real uh, physiological consequences result from just living your daily life. And from that extrapolation going into the deep peer reviewed published scientific research, bringing that forward, looking at data, looking at hypotheses, which generate experiments, which turn into evidence that result in the publication of those papers. And then into the corpus of what we call the knowledge base that people get a, an authentic understanding of how science operates and also what it does and it does not do, right? And that's what I try to really separate out, what we are capable of understanding from scientific research and then what is beyond scientific research because there's a huge um, gap there. And I would like to be able to close the gap as much as possible so that we really understand only the authenticity and in my particular discipline, biochemistry. So 
the dialectical event ontology of aging, la lezione finale. Today again, 14th of December, and you already know the year. So let's start this lecture. All right, now, I'm doing this as a means to disambiguate what I'm calling pleiotropic biochemical and physiological phenomena and those incorporated are within the envelope of human aging unto death, aging unto death. And I'm saying that by doing that and by incorporating all the basic scientific research that we've looked at, it's necessary to explore at a transcendental level <clears throat> the molecular events of metabolic pathways within changing cellular networks over the natural lifespan. Now, metabolic pathways, I mean everything from DNA recombination, DNA repair, DNA replication, RNA transcription, RNA splicing, RNA processing, nuclear export, and then RNA binding with ribosomal RNA and transcription uh, and translation complexes, making polypeptide, and then the exposure of that polypeptide to the cytosolic or the endoplasmic reticulum milieu, given multiple covalent modifications and tailoring of those proteins, carrying out enzymatic activity, ultrastructural activity, signaling activity, extracellular mobilization and communication to the other parts of the system, along with lipids that are generated because of enzymatic activity, generating the endomembranous system, very important, obviously, that entire cascade of signal transduction that results in the living system um, harmonizing with the environment and then being sculpted by what I call the epigenomic or neuroimmune epigenomic axis. And we'll get into that a little bit more towards the end. Okay? That's what I meant when I just said metabolic pathways. So if you haven't, if you haven't uh, encountered what I do in synthetic biochemistry, now you will. Uh, we don't mess around here. All right. So senescent cells. Now remember, senescence is just cellular aging. Okay. What defines a senescent cell? In addition to the essentially permanent growth arrest, which is one of the defining characteristics, several features and molecular markers are used to identify a senescent cell. However, like the growth arrest, no single characteristic is exclusive to the senescent state. Even growth arrest can be somewhat liberated during the senescent process. We've talked a lot about that. Likewise, not all senescent cells display all the senescence markers, as you might guess, and there have been many identified. Thus, senescent cells are generally identified by what I would call a constellation of characteristics. Some are there more prominent uh, and they change over time. This is a dynamic disequilibrium. That's what life is. Because a defining characteristic of senescent cell is arrested growth, though it is a defining characteristic, as opposed to uh, other processes, which involve, of course, rapid cell division throughout lifespan, for example, a necessary but insufficient marker of senescent cells, I call it insufficient, it's necessary but it's insufficient, is an absence of proliferation markers. These are usually transcription factors and uh, just bioenergetic metabolic intermediates. Those are good, two good handles to have right at this point. Now, in addition to all of this, senescent cells generally enlarge often doubling in volume, and if adherent, adopt a flattened morphology. It's just basic cellular physiology, just to, get, just to get you into, inure you into what we're talking about. Now, an important final feature or important um, specific feature of many senescent cells is the SASP. That's the senescence associated secretory phenotype. So SASP is arguably the most striking feature of these cells because it has the potential 
to explain the role of cellular senescence as a dynamic system in organismal aging and in age-related pathologies. SAS components include a large number of cytokines, chemokines, growth factors, and proteases, and lipases, and on and on. Whereas some SAS factors are known or suspected to fuel what could be described as a deleterious effect of senescent cells, other factors, or even the same factors now changing their role because the cellular system itself is changing, may actually generate beneficial effects. And we talked about this very recently in the audio lectures, right? The difference between senescence and, for example, apoptosis, which could include neurodegeneration if it's in the CNS, or just as bad, cell proliferation leading to oncogenesis, tumorigenesis. Right? Now, the SAS can stimulate cell proliferation itself, though, owing to proteins such as the GROs, those are growth-regulated oncogenes. So a lot of um, acronyms used in biochemistry and in cell physiology and in whole animal physiology. And so I know that you're used to it by now. Uh, but when, when it's important, I bring them up so you get so you know the handles for these, right? All right. Where was I at? Growth-regulated oncogenes and amphiregulin, as well as stimulate new blood vessel formation. That would, of course, be angiogenesis, owing to proteins such as VEGF, that's vascular endothelial growth factor. Right? So I'm just re I'm just re um, minding you so that you can recollect and objectively what we've been talking about for the last 12 months, right? Almost more than that now. Now, that's all correct. Now, however, the SASP also includes proteins that have complex effects on cells. For example, the biphasic Wnt signaling modulator, SFRP1. I love the strange names these proteins have. Many of them were named, of course, in Drosophila, others in yeast, both model organisms. Um, and SFRP is called secreted frizzles related protein one and the interleukin uh, six, which is very important in understanding pro-inflammation. And all of that can stimulate or inhibit wind signaling and cell proliferation respectively. And again, depending on reception. And that depends then, the reception depends on whether or not receptors are expressed. And then we could largely just call that physiological context. Yeah. So chronic wind signaling can drive both differentiated and stem cells in the senescence, overriding the normal differentiation to some terminal state and going right into senescence. Okay, So these things happen all the time in different cellular lineages. Now, a particular relevance to the role of cellular senescence in aging and age-related disease, many of these SAS components directly or indirectly promote inflammation, inflammation without infection, okay? Now, the factors include interleukin-6, interleukin-8, a variety of monocyte chemoattractin proteins and macrophage inflammatory proteins and other proteins that regulate multiple aspects of inflammation, such as the granulocyte macrophage colonize stimulating factor. The secretion of those proteins and several more that have similar physiological characteristics okay, are predicted to cause chronic inflammation as we age, chronic systemic and systematic infection. Chronic has to do, of course, with the temporality of it. Systemic has to do with coming from a source and then spreading out. And systematic means it's all there all the time but stochastically, okay? So we can say that at least locally and possibly systemically. See how I was able to put that back together in the end of that sentence or statement. Chronic inflammation, of course, is a cause of or an important contributor to virtually every major age-related disease. And those include the degenerative and the hyperplastic, okay? Now, finally, SASP is itself a plastic phenotype. That means a phenotype that can be generated 
And then once it's generated, it maintains its modality as opposed to elastic, which means you generate a modality and the modality can be lost. Now that does also occur throughout aging and we call that epigenetic phenomenon to put a large handle around it, right? Because epigenetics is both elastic and plastic in, in cellular fate, history and bio, pathobiochemical processing. Okay. So it's a plastic phenotype in its most strict sense. That is, now I go on to explain it, proteins that are included in the SASP vary among cell types and to some extent with the stimulus inducing the senescent response. We talked a lot about this recently in the audio lectures. Nevertheless, there's always a caveat. There is substantial overlap amongst SASPs. Pro-inflammatory cytokines are the most highly conserved feature cutting across many different cell types and senescent inducing stimuli. Okay. So this is giving you what I've called the either or system, right? All right. Now, there's a primary senescent cell. And let's say it's going through DNA damage repair. That's what that DDR is. I think I can make this smaller. Yeah. That damage repair process will generate certain cytokines. That is like causalated secreted proteins like TGF beta and interleukin 1 beta. Those can then function on a normal cell to increase the amount of NADPH oxidase expression and activity. That's an OX4 protein. During the process of NADPH oxidase activity, you generate reactive oxygen species. These are partially reduced forms, usually radical forms of molecular oxygen, like superoxide, hydroxyl anion, and even to some extent, hydrogen peroxide and hydroperoxies. This will then generate a DNA damage and following that, a DNA damage repair process, which will then send similar signals to a secondary senescent cell, further enhancing its DNA repair and then increasing the SAS process, kind of like a chain reaction of events, okay? So you'll turn a normal cell now into a secondary senescent cell through this process. That's why we call it a secretory phenotype. It's not simply cell-cell contact here. This is actually acting as what? As a paracrine um, transcendental process. Trans by transcendental, I mean overarching, over-controlling. Right? and excluding all the particulars to get a point of concept, right? All right. Let's put me out somewhere over here. Let's continue. So, of course, I put it right where the writing is, but I did want you to see this beautiful cedar. <clears throat> a dialectical approach, which is what we use here, allows for the either-or method, which I just alluded to, Either there is the affirming phenomena, the negating phenomena, or the synthetic event. Okay. Study of the agent human through the lifespan draws upon the event ontology of the living system. And I very much emphasize the agent human because each individual makes choices in their environment, in their diet, in their behavior, in the way they live their life. And all of this is folded into the neuroimmunoepigenome, which becomes ultimately the living system that goes later in life as we age into multiple morbidities and death. So it's an individual agentic process. It's very important. Medicine tries to collectivize uh, major disorders, let's say something like cardiac hypertrophy or glioblastoma or hepatocellular carcinoma, and then treat it as if that disease that was discovered and studied, say, in a mammalian model can be taken inductively into a human 
system and same kind of drugs, same kind of therapies, including surgeries, can be applied to what was discovered in the model organisms. And also at the level of gene expression and membrane lipid raft mobility and the expression on the surface of plasma membrane of certain cell surface receptors, which allow for correct or incorrect communication with the extracellular milieu. All of that gets indu inductively generated into what we think human diseases are doing at the same time. And that is a huge leap of faith, okay? Because what we study in animal models uh, it is in animal models and we understand it well. What we study in humans, once we, when we do that leap of faith from extrapolation, from the deductive processing and from the uh, analysis of data and then generation of evidence from those studies in subclinical research uh, often do not play out the same way in the human population, particularly in this specific event of the individual agent. Hence the concern over induction that goes way back in philosophical and in scientific literature. Now, because of the temporal nature of living unto death, because that's what's going on here, right? Things are constantly changing over time, sequentially and non-sequentially. The exposed mechanism involves what I call a trigonal planar dimensionality, which I've shown you many times before, if you follow my lectures. It's what I, what I call the dialectical event ontology. I'll show you it graphically uh, towards the end of this talk. And it is a lived experience that requires three aspects of interaction. Okay. Genomics, that is what is inherited, generally speaking. The environment, the world in which the agent exists and moves through, which changes, of course. And then the neuroimmunoepigenomics, which involves the axis of interaction between the first two and then all of the deployment of mechanisms which the neurological system uh, generates, the immunological system carries out and communicates, and then the epigenetic reprogramming, for example, of gene expression, individual cellular uh, phenotypic uh, transmitted um, gener and generated phenotypes, all of that then puts it together into this trigonal planar interaction. Okay. And that's what I've hopefully, I'm trying to convince people of. All right. So here's a statement. Senescent cells drive aging and cancer. It's more of an interrogative, but it's still a statement, right? Why would we make it if we didn't think that's possible? So let's get into this. Senescent cells can disrupt normal tissue structures, yes. For example, the presence of senescent fibroblasts disrupts alveolar and branching morphogenesis. Effects of the senescent fibroblasts then can be due primarily to the secretion of matrix metalloproteinases, MMPs, which are prominent, yes, indeed, SAT components. Now, these senescent mediated effects are hypothesized to cause or contribute to certain age-related changes in the breast. Okay. Senescent pulmonary smooth muscle cells stimulated the proliferation and migration of neighboring smooth muscle cells in part due to the secretion of a small number of cytokines, IL-6 and IL-8, and other factors, including these extracellular matrix proteins, now, all these senescence-mediated effects are then hypothesized to cause or contribute to intimal thickening and medial hypertrophy, now we're into pathophysiology, of the pulmonary arteries, which ultimately can result in, yeah, pulmonary hypertension. You see, we went from the uh, biochemical to the physiological in one statement. As a final example of just right here where we're at, senescent cells were seen to increase the frequency in normal and premature aging skin. So we're out of the pulmonary system and we're into the skin, the integument, right? 
And that contributes to age-related dermal and epidermal thinning. Does this sound like aging? It sure does. And loss of collagen, perhaps owing to the secretion of those matrix metalloproteases. Senescent cells and the SASP itself can also fuel overt age-related disease. For example, senescence and associated SASP of astrocytes, now we're in the central nervous system, can promote the age-related neurodegeneration uh, that gives rise to cognitive impairment, as well as to Alzheimer's disease, which is a separate sort of pathology, and Parkinson's disease, which is yet another pathology of the CNS. Okay. So senescent cells can also drive, I'm answering the question, hyperplastic path pathologies. Co-injection of a senescent but not non-senescent fibroblast sig significantly stimulated the proliferation of mouse and human epithelial tumor cells in immunocompromised mice. You already have to throw in that caveat and see it's in mice. In addition to stimulating tumor growth in mice, SAS factors can stimulate malignant phenotypes in culture. One such phenotype is the all-important EMT, epithelial to mesenchymal transition. We talked a lot about this in lecture. So this morphological transition, because it is a morphological one, of course, underlying the morphologies, biochemistry, and physiology, all of that enables transformed epithelial cells to invade and migrate through tissues and is therefore critical for the development of yeah, metastatic cancer. Okay. All right, now that's SASP involving cancer. So I'm answering the question I just started with, right? Now, we're going to move into more hardcore, at least lymphocytic immune responses. So what are T lymphocytes? They are potent, typically host tolerant immunologic agents, their cells, right? That do not necessarily conform toward terminal differentiation. Now see right there, there's all kinds of complex properties of even T lymphocytes, which I'm gonna show you wonderful diagrams of how they differentiate. Now I'm telling you, not necessarily conform to those terminal differentiations. Why? Because of soluble or secreted factors, such as what can be generated from SAF, such as cytokines, chemokines, growth factors, matrix metalloproteases, certain lipid molecules like eicosanoids. So, for example, let's get into it. There are TH, that's T helper cells or T effector cells, and three main branches, type 1, type 2, and type 17. And those come from CD4 positive T lymphocytes, right? Um, that's after thymic um, education to prevent host-mediated autoimmune responses. And that's through the configuration of the T cell receptor, right? Remember when we talked about all that? I warned you that when I was doing all those lectures, that I would make a statement and it would be a three hours worth of lecture, right? I just did that. You also have cytotoxic T lymphocytes. That comes from the CD8 positive lineage. And also associated with CD8 are the natural killer T cells. All these are slightly different, differentiated T lymphocytes. Okay. You also have so-called innate lymphoid cells or ILCs and one more, T follicular cells. Okay. So you have multiple types of classes of T lymphocytes. And then there's all kinds of subdivisions within them. So they are all differentiated. That's why we can describe them as these different species, they're activated and stabilized via cell-mediated epigenetic and bioenergetic events. Yes, bioenergetic in terms of how ATP is made, fatty acid beta oxidation, glucose beta glycolysis, TCA cycle electron transport, oxidation of NADH, ultimately T3 
taking oxygen to water, that sort of thing, making ATP, the oxidative phosphorylation, all of that for bioenergetics. And the epigenetics include methylation, acetylation being the prominent kinds of covalent modification of nucleotides in proximal regions near, for example, a promoter regions or enhancer regions or splice variant associated regions within nascent DNA before transcription, making multiple domains so proteins can be recombined, right? Um, and then there's much more epigenetics, microRNA, another one you can think about, right? And more and more than that. These are all dynamic modalities, right? All right. In all of those epigenetic and bioenergetic events target specific foreign antigens, Okay, that's what these, remember we're talking about T lymphocytes still, right? And thus are regulated by distinct transcription factors. Now we're intracellular. The bioenergetics, of course, is largely intracellular too, but not only because you have to think about circulating, oh, well, for example, triacylglycerol on the backbone of lipoproteins, not covalently associated, of course. And then just think about circulating glucose and free amino acids, right? All of which can be carbon sources for bioenergetics. You know this. Um, but anyways, transcription factors, cytokines, chemokines, growth factors, and even lipids. Okay. So we're emphasizing now some of the major players in the role that must be ordained and then played out during the aging process. And it happens in ways that change both elastically and plastically over microseconds and over days, weeks, months, and years. Again, in relatively stochastic modalities. Relative, because whenever we describe these things, you have to think about the individual agent, the individual human being, for example, and how they are aging, as opposed even to say their twin brother, identical twin brother. And they do age differently, even with the same genome. Hence the tripartite dialectical event ontology, which is what I tried to emphasize. And we will get to that. Okay. Now we're going to get into some detail here. I don't know really why I wanted to do that, but I did. Uh, because it's authentic biochemistry. And I don't want to just give you this final lecture and not add the detail that we talked about. So you see here, CD8 T cells, right? In the presence of interleukin-12, now differentiating into a cell that has these transcription factors. We talked about this many times. I've used this slide many times. Here's where it comes from. This particular paper was published in 2017, but this still pretty much stands, only we know even more, right? This generates the, the phenotype for a cytotoxic T cell, and then the presence of interferon gamma can enhance the T helper as a CD4 positive lineage inflammatory response. Again, the presence of certain um, glycoproteins like these chemokines and chemokine receptor and indeed other cytokines. Likewise, a CD4 positive cell in the presence again of interleukin-12. This was also in that same presence. And here we're increasing the expression of transcription factor called T-bet over time with all these lineages. You can generate just a cell that makes a lot of T-bet a transcription factor. So a unique set of genes are transcribed in those cells that becomes a TH1 lineage. It goes directly into the pro-inflammatory response. However, a CD4 positive T cell can also go this route, which is the T follicular helper cells. Okay. Now we're in the presence again of interleukin-12, but also interleukin-6. It's certain molar ratios will give you now a different transcription factor um, recipe. This BCL6 plus TBET. This will give you the T follicular helper cell. Now, what are those? TFHs are a specialized subset of CD4 positive T cells, first identified in the human tonsil, not in the uh, mammalian model. And it looks like they play a critical role in protective immunity, helping B cells, another kind of lymphocyte, not the T cell, produce antibody, you know, those glycoproteins, those antibodies, right? Uh, immunoglobulins, for example, IgGs, are the more soluble secreted ones you find in the blood, against foreign pathogens. TFHs are therefore located in secondary lymphoid organs. Those are called slows. And those include the tonsil, the spleen, and all the lymph nodes scattered around the periphery of the body. Right? So that's where T follicular cells show up. 
Now that same cell in the presence of interleukin 21 and interferon gamma can go on to help this differentiation of this B cell. That's what this is talking about here. Making a B cell that's going to generate antibodies like IgG2A. And then that cell can finally differentiate into a plasma cell, which is basically a terminal differentiation of a B cell, even from memory libraries of B cells. And that's going to produce massive amounts then of antibody to a specific antigen, which is showing you here. All right. And it's going to require these transcription factors, this BLIMP1 and still TBET, because it's all increasing here. TH17 cells with the ROR gamma T transcription factor in the presence of interleukin 12 are going to now start generating the transcription factor TBET and then acting like TH17 cells. And there is the interleukin 17, which is why they're named that. Also in the presence of interferon gamma, enhancing the TH1 pro-inflammatory response. And ultimately one more CD4 positive cell the Treg, with its transcription factor, the lonely Fox P3, which we talked a lot about in lecture over this last year, and the presence of a unique cytokine called interleukin 27, which you normally don't hear about because it's a regulatory protein, basically. It basically is acting like a, um, a paracrine ligand binding to its receptor. It's really not acting as, certainly not as a pro-inflammatory cytokine. That's going to generate more Tbet with, along with Fox P3 as transcription factors. And this will block the inflammatory response. Hence, they're called T regulatory cells or T suppressor cells in the older literature. Now, why am I showing you all of this? To give you a little bit more detail here. Now, take a look at this interaction. You've got a protein that's got infill 3. We'll talk more about this in a minute. That's a particular transcription factor, but you've also got this ID2, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. And we're going to call this protein a CH or this cell a CHILP, all of which I'm going to describe to you now in detail. Now, notice there's a protein here called the PLZF plus. When plus in the cell lineage, it means it's being expressed. Now you could make an ILC one, two, or three, or you could make an LTI. Okay. Ultimately, the net phenotype is going to be a CHILP which is a common helper-like ILC progenitor. And ILC is an innate lymphoid cell. So these are unique to all those cells I just showed you. Now, why all this filigree? Why all this intense Baroque discussion of T lymphocytes? I'm just giving you a window into what aging is about. All of these processes are occurring, again, in basically a stochastic, but not a paradigmatically um, completely random way, right? All involved in that interaction between the environment, the genome, and then through the processing axis of the neurological system, right? Think about neuroendocrine system, the immune system, which we're embedded in here, involving all these cytokines, chemokines, growth factors, uh, um, matrix metalloproteinases, lipids all circulating and involved in carrying out signal transduction cascades. Right? Plus the, the, the final aspect of it, altering via epigenetics. So let's go back again to the specifics. And I blew you all the way up to 30,000 feet. Let's go back into this. It's a protein here called PLZF. That's a pro, is the way it was named, myelocytic leukemia zinc finger protein. We were talking about proteins that had zinc in them. They, they, this is how they bind to DNA. They're DNA binding proteins. Therefore, they're going to be involved in either DNA recombination, DNA repair, or, or transcription, to name three. Okay. It's a family of, these happen to be a family of transcription factors. And they're specific to CD1 D-restricted natural killer T lymphocytes. Remember those CD8 pathway. So if you have PLZF deficient natural killer T lymphocytes, the cells fail to undergo what's known as an intrathymic. Thymus is where these cells are being tailored at the TCR level, T cell receptor level, to prevent what? Autoimmune activity and effector differentiation that characterize their lineage. So they fail to undergo that expansion and effector differentiation. They don't have that one protein. Okay. So cell intrinsic infill ablation, now that's there's where infill comes into play. I'll talk about more about what that is in a moment. 
results in an impaired development also of ILC subsets, right? These are all innate lymphoid cells with their own distribution and effect in normal physiology, normal biochemistry, and in the pathological characteristics of both of those systems. Okay. So NFIL3 deficiency leads to a loss of common helper-like ILC progenitors, and that's what the chilps are, and that's the big picture shown here. So NFIL3 is controlled itself by mesenchyme-derived cytokine interleukin-7 in those lymphoid precursors. So NFIL3 exerts its function in the CHILP via direct regulation of a protein. One more we're adding, that's ID2. So you got PLZF. You've got ID2 that has to be high to start off with a chilp cell. And you notice this cell has to be able to receive via this gamma C receptor interleukin 7. It's going to phosphorylate STAT5 protein. That's going to enhance the transcription of NFIL3. And NFIL3 is going to enhance the transcription of ID2. You see? A hierarchical cascade, all necessary for even the induction of the early phases of innate lymphoid cells. Again, I'm giving you this pedigreed understanding to let you see the true complexity of cellular differentiation. You hear people uh, or you read papers that talk about, well, Th1 cells, Th2 cells are involved in, uh, oh, again, megoblastoma or something. Or they're involved in certain kinds of non-small cell lung cancer. And you say, okay, we're going to target that cell. Understand when you talk about that cell lineage, Underneath that generalized conceptual description are all the details of all the transcription factors and all the hierarchical interaction necessary, even to run that cell lineage halfway through its processing to some kind of semi-terminal differentiation. Okay. Okay. So let's go on. Innate lymphoid cells originate from the common innate lymphoid cell progenitor. <laughs> That's the CHOP shown there, right? However, the transcriptional program that sets identity of those lineages, and there are the lineages, four of them, right, still remains somewhat elusive. So we don't know if there is a transcriptional program, but they're starting to tear it out. And these are papers published in 2015 up through about 2019, all on this one slide. Okay. Now, what was discovered starting back then is this, this paper show that infill 3 acts downstream of interleukin-7, because see, that has to happen first, you see. Uh, and that means you have to have the receptor there. And then you get the emergence of a helper ILC progenitor via the direct regulation of that ID2. And that's shown there. And all that has to go down right at the beginning. Okay. So ID2, now I'm going to explain what that is, right? I told you I would. That's a transcriptional regulator, once again, as you have noticed. It's in the cell, and when you see a positive sign like that, it's inside the cell. That typically means it's a transcription factor. That means it's going to turn on a suite of expression of new genes to be involved in that differentiation that you're looking at. In fact, different the, the maybe the expression of new transcription factors. That's exactly what's going down here. TBET, GATA3, ROR gamma t and ROR gamma t down here again are all different transcription factors that needed to be expressed at the transcriptional level to get those differentiations of those different um, innate lymphoid cells. Okay. So ID2 is a transcriptional regulator lacking a basic DNA binding domain, which negatively nevertheless regulates the basic helix loop, helix trans, the BHLH as they're called, transcription factors by forming heterodimers and inhibiting their DNA binding and transcriptional activity. So these are like suppressor proteins controlling the transcriptional phenotype that the major transcription factor, because it's acting, for example, as a zinc finger, to open up the chromatin, allow for fresh nation, massive transcription of whatever that cell lineage is going to differentiate into. Because of the different components of the extracellular milieu, such as interleukin-7, and then those other ones, interleukin-12, interleukin-27, et cetera, interleukin-6, interleukin-8, involved in the fine-tuning of that transcriptional repertoire regulation. This is all the fine points going down to the cell, right? Variety of cellular processes, including growth, senescence, differentiation, cell death, angiogenesis, if they happen to be in that kind of cell lineage, neoplastic transformation, that's a bad thing, obviously. And so 
ID2 inhibits skeletal muscle <coughs> and cardiac myocyte differentiation. So you see how there it has that kind of effect, right? It controls terminal differentiation. That's the kind of transcription factor. It does. It's just necessary for all cell lineages, obviously. Not, not to be left behind. Also, It also regulates the circadian clock by repressing the transcriptional activator activity of the clock artinal BMAL1 heterodimer. Now, we talked about that when we talked about clock genes, so I'm not going to give you the detail, but that's how basically di chron chronological diurnal fluctuations as well as long-term chronological effects on cell differentiation are controlled by clock genes, okay? So ID2 is part of that because it forms this heterodimer with the system, right? Or generating an activity that causes this heterodimer to bind and to localize to the cytoplasm in this case. So therefore it plays a role both in the input and output pathways of the circadian clock. In the input component, it's involved in modulating the magnitude of photic entrainment that's, of course, through vision, right? So that deals with the optic nerve association. And it's involved in modulating uh, of, of the photic entrainment and then the output component contributes to the regulation of a variety of liver clock control genes involved in lipid metabolism. Hmm, very important to me as a lipid biochemist. So you see that's one protein carrying out multiple functions depending on cell lineage differentiation in totally different parts of the body. All of this can be impacted by an inflammatory response caused by an agent becoming infected, for example, with a bacterium or an agent becoming intoxicated with too much ethanol or an agent exposed to asbestos or an agent exposed to not enough sunlight or too much sunlight. You see why it's agentic, always agentic. The environment plays a role here. These are not just responses that are, in other words, constantly acting, acting just this way. <clears throat> That's a really important take home message I want to give you. All right, so more of the detail here. <clears throat> well, type T reg cells, Fox P3 positive. Look what ID3 is doing here. It's blocking this pathway. <clears throat> so these are going to be wild type T reg cells making plenty of Fox P3, which is going to block effector cells. So it's going to act suppressor like because of regulating all these other intermediates in the, in the transcription pathway, the signal transduction transcription pathway. When you have a deficiency in ID3, there's a double knockout in mouse. What happens is you tank ID3, of course, and it's going to explain in a second here. That means you allow for the expression of this transcription factor E47, so high activity. That's going to allow high levels of spy B, which were not occurring here which is going to enhance SOX3, which is further enhanced by E47, all that's going to tank FOXP3 expression. So FOXP3 minus now, you get no or very little Treg suppression. Hence the block, you see. You don't, it blocks the, the suppression. There's no suppression of the effector cell. So you can get rampant inflammation, okay? So regulatory T cells suppress the development of inflammatory disease. We all know this. But our knowledge of the regulators of transcription that control the function remains incomplete. Here you see, again, this was a paper published in 2016 and a 2014 paper. So I'm getting you some multiple sources. There's another paper, right? Multiple sources. This is what we do in authentic biochemistry. Our knowledge of transcription regulators control this function remains complete. Here we show the expression of ID2 and ID3 in T reg cells. And I found it requ be required to suppress the development of a fatal inflammatory disease. Okay, in the mouse model. They found that T cell antigen, rece TCR receptor driven signaling initially decreased the abundance of ID3, and initially brought that down which led to the activation of follicular regulatory T, TFR cell-specific transcription signature. However, sustained lower abundance of ID2 and 3 interfere with proper development of those cells and a depletion of either ID2 and ID3 or in combination in Treg cells resulted in compromised maintenance and localization of Treg population. Thus, it was shown that ID2 and ID3 enforce this 
T follicular follicular regulatory lineage because right? they're working at that level of differentiation at the T follicular cell level. Okay, so there you go. Another paper just to make sure you get the complexity even more uh, embedded. Paper published uh, in Cell. Okay, again, this is way back in 2011. It's fine to look at papers because these are the canonical papers from which future research becomes, right? If they're done well. Presence of interleukin 6, pro-inflammatory cytokine hypoxia means the lack of oxygen, right? Like an ischemic attack will increase reactive oxygen, increase reactive nitrogen. Also, possibly fumarate and succinate because the TCA cycle slows down. Because of why? Because of the lack of complete oxidation of NADH. The dehydrogenases get snuffed out. So you build up TCA intermediates. Look what happens. You generate HIF-1, okay? HIF-1 then will bind with FOXP3, making this very complex system that will ubiquitinylate FOXP3 and degrade it. So that prevents Treg regulation just because of this pro-inflammatory environmental response. You get it, just simple hypoxia, ischemia, right? Lack of oxygen or an induction of high levels of reactive oxygen, which are usually associated with or not necessarily, just a slowing down of, again, electron transport chain, which can occur for multiple reasons, such as an overloading, which can be caused by competing beta oxidation of fatty acids and glycolysis. Yes, that happens in obesogenic systems, okay? Now, in a, that's happened in Treg, but in a Th17 cell, what you get is a production of the Rohr gamma T and a, now a, a, a Th17 differentiation is enhanced. This is a pro-inflammatory cytokine, remember, which enhanced the what? The Th1 pro-inflammatory system, which is the major pro-inflammatory system in the body as regulated by T lymphocytes. So nuclear receptor that binds DNA as a monomer like the Rohr, remember that's the retinoic acid orphan receptor response. Uh, those are the roars then, because you talk about the elements, that's the DNA, right? Cisacting elements. Contain a single core motif, and that's 5' prime AGGTCA. That's the, that's the actual nucleotide sequence that must be there for this to function. Okay. So any mutations in that won't function. You get it. And mutations increase with aging. Okay. It's preceded by a short AT rich sequence. That's necessary too. Key regulator of cell differentiation, immunity, peripheral circadian rhythm, as well as lipid, steroid. Well, steroids are lipid, so that means acyl lipid like fatty acid, steroid, xenobiotic, and glucose metabolism. And there are multiple papers showing that. It's considered to have an intrinsic transcriptional activity, it has some natural ligands like oxysterols, which are generated on lipoproteins in long term circulation of cholesterol. And they act as agonists like 25 hydroxy cholesterol or inverse agonists like seven oxygenated sterols. Yeah. Enhancing or repressing respectively the transcriptional activity. Okay. More papers. Recruits distinct combinations of cofactors to target gene regulatory regions to modulate their transcriptional expression depending on the tissue time and promoter context. All of that is from the HIF. Okay. Totally now dismantling that fine, wonderful differentiation pathway we just went through. Okay. Just by having an ischemic attack or an inflammatory response locally, um, or just because of the slowing down, again, the electron transport chain. You get the idea where I'm, why I've showed these, hopefully. Now, you can make some hypothetical deductions here, which is what I did when I was first presenting this to you guys. Aliases for infill 3 gene nuclear factor in a leukin-3. Look at all the different names it has. That's because it was describing what it was doing. One of the others is in a leukin-3 binding protein, right? E4 promoter binding protein. Those are all, and when you look in the literature, it's all synonymous, same protein. But it's doing different functions. Therefore, is it the same protein? Once you change the cellular environment, you change the function. Right? Because of different reception, different modalities different transcription, translational rates, different bioenergetics, all this changing over time. So it is, an infill 3 a transcription factor recognized and binds this sequence. It's a sequence present in many cellular, but also in viral promoters. How about that? Repressive transcription from promoters by activating transcription factor ATF sites, 
activates transcription from interleukin-3 promoters and T lymphocytes. It's a component of the circadian clock. This is infill. And so it acts as a negative regulator of circadian expression of PER2 oscillation. It's one of the clock genes. And also protects pro-B cells from program cell death. Okay, so you get the idea of all the different roles infill can play. Okay, infill is again nuclear factor interleukin three infill. Okay, now I gave you all that detail. Now let's do the end. Okay, consider this the fourth movement of the last symphony, which is the aging lecture arc. Let's go, let's remind ourselves of some categorical logic. Square of opposition. So glad I learned this when I took an early philosophy course as an undergraduate. Logical opposition occurs among standard form categorical propositions. One, if they have the same subject and predicate terms, and two, they differ in quality or quantity or both. Second aspect of the square of opposition. Consider the kinds of opposition that can arise with different quantity and quality. Okay. You're opposing now different concepts at a logical level. And I'm going to use this. I always use this when I study biochemistry. There is a logic to the interaction that goes on. And there's also an illogic to ascribing aspects of biochemistry and physiology that are not logical bearing to an understanding of the premises used to describe the experiments that are studying something, generating experiments that ultimately lead to data and evidence, which nevertheless were categorically illogical. This can happen, yes. Okay. So case one, they differ in quantity and quality. They differ in quality, but not quantity. They differ in quantity and not quality, and they have the same. That's a trivial case, okay? Because that's not a real opposition, right? right? All right, there's the square, okay? Sorry how it looks. Uh, it's now a fancy looking, a bunch of colors. It doesn't need to be. It's interesting enough just in black and white, right? So you have four corners of this square. You see, four corners, A, E, I, O. Let's go through them. Four corners of the chart represent four basic forms of propositions, recognized again in classic, essentially Aristotelian logic. A propositions are universal affirmatives, all SRP. E propositions are universal negations, no SRP. So all SRP, no SRP. Then there's the I proposition down here as a subalternation of A, a particular affirmatives take the form of some SRP, and the O proposition is subalteration alternation of E. Remember, that's the universal negative. The O proposition is a particular negation, some S or not P. Okay. Four corners of the chart, then, represent the four basic forms of propositions in categorical or classical logic. A propositions or universal affirmatives take the form all SRP, E, no SRP, I, some SRP, O, some S or not P. Just to remind you. Okay. Given the assumption made within classical Aristotelian categorical logic, then, that every category contains at least one member, following relationships depicted in the square world hold. Now, do we have to assume that? Well, no, we can say that it's not within categorical logic. Now, I dare you to think about things that are not within categorical logic. And that includes things like dream sequences and imagination, because they do follow categorical logic. Categorical log logic doesn't tell you what's true or false. It tells you how you can find what's true or false. It's a method. It's a transcendental method because it rises above the particular, right? It brackets off the particular and it looks at the conceptual level. And you ask that question first before you get down into generating a hypothetical deduction like does ceramide 1-phosphate control the uh, translocation of a potassium voltage-gated channel 
to the surface of a stimulated neuron in the, um, I don't know, amygdala. Okay, just an example, right? So given the assumptions made within classical categorical logic, that every logic, that every category can easily one member, following relationships depicted in the square have to hold. So what are they? Okay, now this is, a, this is one of those classic black and white pictures. If you look at it, you see a young woman with a bonnet. If you look at it again, you see an old woman, okay? A very old woman. I hope you can see both of them at the same time. I've trained myself to see both. See if you can. First, A and O propositions are contradictory, as are E and I propositions. Contradictory means they cannot both be true, as opposed to contrary. So, propositions are contradictory when the truth of one implies the falsity of the other. And conversely, here we see that the truth of a proposition of the form all S or P must imply the falsity of the corresponding proposition of the form some S are not P. The subaltern, remember? For example, if the proposition, now I'm getting definite here, all aging is indefinite, that would be an A proposition, a universal affirmative. Is, if that's true, then the proposition some aging is not indefinite, O must be false because it's a subaltern of the universal negation. Right? Similarly, if no aging is indefinite, that's the E, that's the universal negation. If that's false, no aging is indefinite, then the proposition some aging is indefinite has to be true. See, so you formulate by a good compositional understanding of what you're trying to study within categorical logic, and then you put it into the square of opposition before you ever think about a hypothetical deduction for an experiment. This could be false because biology doesn't necessarily always um, follow what we understand as the categories necessary to generate the logic. But if we pick the categories correctly and we make the right assumptions with the way we describe our statements, it will follow, of course, because it's logical. Let's continue. Okay, that's one of my favorite actors, Jimmy Stewart. Why am I showing you three different stages? Because he was a young man, uh, then he was a middle-aged man, and then he became a very old man, and then, yes, he died. Right? All of us will have a similar fate. Right? We won't look like Jimmy Stewart with a nice bow tie at the beginning and the end, but who knows? Maybe some people still wear bow ties. Personally, I don't. Now, I showed you that to keep in mind. A and E propositions are contrary. Propositions are contrary when they cannot both be true. An A proposition, for example, all aging ends in death, cannot be true at the same time in the same space as the corresponding E proposition. No aging ends in death, the immortality utopia, right? Note, however, the corresponding A and E propositions, while contrary, have another really important feature. They are not contradictory. Well, they cannot both be true. They can both be false. Keep that in mind. Okay. And is it contrary that you had a young Jimmy Stewart and a middle-aged and an old Jimmy Stewart and it was still the same human being? Maybe contrary to think that way, but it's not contradictory. Okay. Now you start to understand, you can take something as a gross physiological presentation and start to apply it to categorical logic. And I invite you to do that. Now here's another favorite actress of mine. Um, the later, later movies, maybe not so good, but she was good in a lot of great movies that occurred in the 40s, particularly in the 50s and the early 60s. This, of course, is Elizabeth Taylor. Elizabeth Taylor is a young woman. Elizabeth Taylor, middle age, kind of and Elizabeth Taylor closer to when she passed away. Okay, quite different looking person. Well, all aging ends in death is still another major thing to keep in mind. Now, listen to what I say here. I and O propositions are subcontrary. Propositions are subcontrary when it's impossible for both to be false. Because if some aging results in death, 
I, that's an I proposition, is false. Some aging does not result in death, must, that's the O proposition, must be true. Note, however, that it is possible for corresponding subalterns I and O propositions both to be true. Again, I and O propositions are subcontrary, but they're not contrary, and they're certainly not contradictory. Okay? Once again, apply it to the Liz Taylor idea about young, middle-aged, old, okay? and her aging process. Now, final thing to think about. Now we're out into the uh, canyon lands. Two propositions are said to stand in relation of subalternation when the truth of the first, that's the sub, that's the superaltern, implies the truth of the second, that's the subaltern, but not conversely. So propositions stand in this subalternation relation with the corresponding, so A proposition stands in a subalternation relation with the corresponding I proposition. Hence, the truth of the A proposition, I'm giving you the example, all aging results in death, okay, that would be a universal, right, implies the truth of the proposition, some aging results in death. That's the subaltern I, okay? Got it. Now, however, the truth of the O proposition, some aging does not result in death, does not imply the truth of the E proposition, no aging results in death. So you see the modality, of, and in fact, not just modality, but the relationships of these propositions are unique to the kind of proposition you make. Square of opposition doesn't yield a completely isodiametric teleology, or for that matter, metaphysics or epistemology. So, in traditional logic, the truth of an A and O proposition implies the truth of the corresponding I or O, respectively, of course. Consequently, the falsity of an I or O proposition implies the falsity of the corresponding A or E. So then when you look at particulars, they can negate the universal. You see how powerful this is in terms of thinking about the logic behind studying metabolic systems or something grandiose like the aging process. Now, the resonating feature here of summarized, the truth of a particular proposition does not imply the truth of the corresponding universal proposition, nor does the falsity of the universal proposition carry downwards to the respective particular proposition. Okay. Once again, this is a relational interaction of categorical logic within the modalities, right? What is, what can be, what cannot be. Those are the modalities, right? Okay. So I've existential import here. Without the traditional presuppositions of existential import, that is the supposition all categories have at least one member, which you would assume, then only the contradictory relation will hold. That means on what is sometimes called the modern square of opposition, the lines for contraries, subcontraries, and subalternation can be erased, leaving only the diagonal lines for contradiction relationships. Now, if we cannot presuppose and therefore assert as a first premise, because it has not been demonstrated in all of biological study, the concept that all aging does not result in death, remember that's the E proposition, then we cannot assert that some aging does not result in death, the subalternate O proposition. Therefore, we may not conclude that some aging may or may not result in death, allowing I and O to both be true the event aging, then, is not a linear ontology, as it does not contain the possibility of an infinite progression to immortality or to never living. Therefore, logic requires that the conclusion necessarily obtains an inevitable end of aging. 
as it is evidenced in nature, all aging ends in death. And I say QED. I don't think we can argue against that. And the scientific literature doesn't argue against that. And phenotypic and experience observation doesn't argue against this categorical, logical conclusion. And it fits very well in the square of opposition. So we use logic to understand nature. It agrees with nature. Therefore, nature follows categorical logic. You could argue that too. See how this works. Now, final slide. The aging die of Entome. Okay. Now, what is the aging die of Entome? This is the interaction between genetics, environment, and the neuroimmunoepigenome, which we spent over a year talking about all three of these in great detail. But let me summarize some of the features of each of the three components of the axis. And look at the axis itself. Look at how they're held together by this bonding. Okay? The bonding together into this one central thing. And that thing is the aging individual or the aging dia eventome of an individual who has genetically, as you age, various rates of telomerase decline, thymic involution, redox, therefore reactive oxygen, and gene transcription associated with control and quenching of that, AMP kinase mutations, CREB mutations, remember these involved again in transcription of bioenergetic phenomena and membrane synthesis phenomena because those are lipid associated mTORC mutations again protein synthesis microglial senescence is to do with genetics endocrine failure such as aging such as menopause in women uh recombination repair and uh of dna okay all three aspects of dna disruption fail because of genetics right? Replication, recombination, repair are the three fates of DNA at the biochemical level, pathway level. Those have genetic determinants, right? Which we've described that I've described over the last year. Cell cycle corruption. We've talked a lot about that. Errant expression of CD proteins, for example, CD kinases, all of that have been found in genetic alteration. Microphagy decline, autophagy decline, peroxophagy decline. These are all cell, subcellular um, compartments that do not go through their normal process of being eliminated and then resynthesized, right? And lipid storage disorders, there's just one more genetic one. Now there are also amino acid disorders and carbohydrate disorders, right? Like in glycogen metabolism. So I just put lipid storage because ultimately those interrelate to the other types of inborn errors of metabolism. They usually are triggered by, or they trigger many of those other genetic failures. Now in the environment, I add obesity, okay? Because obesity is to do with too many kilocalories and not enough exercise. That's how a, a, a system becomes obesogenic. So it's part of the environment. It's also part of the agency, right? Ethanol, neurotoxin, talked a lot about it, also will enhance obesity. Drugs of any kind, pharmaceutical as well as uh, recreational drugs, all are environmental factors in generating the aging dia ventone, typically on the negative side of the measures, the negative side of the valence. Parasites. Another really important feature there, right? And these parasites, you can also consider what? Pathogens, right? Intellectual obsolescence, lack of using the mind, regenerating memories, carrying out calculations as you live and work, no longer using your brain to its full capacity. That enhances the aging diaventome. That's an environmental effect that is agentic in nature. Mutagens that you encounter in the environment, 
some some real, some imagined, some potent, some somewhat impotent. We talked a lot about those. Ischemia, right? Small level ischemia in the brain can cause massive features in the penumbra related to such things as the production of an embolism and a stroke just by a minor concussion, right? Or it's by a mild TIA, right? Which can happen when you're young because of sports injuries. Sedentary behavior, n- lack of exercise. That's an environmental key to the aging diaventome. Membrane oxidation is also related to the environment in terms of how much reactive oxygen is generated and the accumulation in the diet of specific very long chain polyunsaturated fatty acids, such as omega-6, omega-3 series. And that then there leads to ultimately diet as a general feature. Ultimately, we, could, we talked about the neuroimmunoepigenome. That involved this huge network, which I call the Reception and Signal Transduction Cascade Network, or the RSTCN. All of that can dysfunction. And that has to do with the neuroendocrine system failure, the, Im- the immune system, either hyperinflammatory or hypoinflammatory response, or disruption of all T, B lymphocyte uh, um, differentiation and activation. Also, all the innate immune cells and the turnover of those. Think about allergens, think about eosinophils, think about mast cells, think about basophils, think about macrophages, think about antigen presenting cells like dendritic cells, right? interacting with T cells, for example. It's all part of that. You get immunosenescence. We talked about that part of the SASP phenotype. We also talked about inflammaging, the increasing in the inflammatory response as we age. We did describe why that occurs because of overreaching the mark by not getting the right level of anti-inflammatory macrophages type two by having too much Treg activity, not enough TH, or too much TA activity, not enough of peripheral Treg, right? That's all part of the immune system. Sarcopenia, the lack of muscular um, activity can lead to the lack of muscular utilization, contraction, normal contraction. This can cause then muscle weakness. And muscle weakness can lead back into living a sedentary lifestyle. Right? But that is clearly part of the neurological immunoepigenome. The epigenome is involved in all of these factors under this part of the axis, this transcendental axial network part of the axis. The HPA axis itself, right? hypothalamus, pituitary, adrenal axis, that's all neuroendocrine. That is affected by neurological aging, neurological corruption, neurological changes because of aging, right? Such as menopause, I said. Um, Lack of testosterone production in men, lack of uh, estrogen production in women, breast cancer is associated with that, right? That's all embedded in what I'm describing here. And of course, cortisol, cortisol production, clip production, the POMC axis, the MPY axis, the agouti-related protein axis, right? All of these things that control the control over diet and satiety and the reward pathway, right? Treg failure, something we just looked at, right? Because of the regulation, for example, of a simple FOXP3 transcription factor. Natural killer cells, cytotoxic T lymphocyte failure, not being able to mobilize those cells to directly kill um let's say pathogen um, um, existing inside cells, right? So intracellular bacteria, intracellular viruses, which is where they always are anyway, intracellular parasites, not having good natural killer uh, uh, activity, not having good cytotoxic T lymphocyte activities, not making those perforins and granzymes to blow apart and kill cells and let them become apoptotic so they're removed by macrophages, type two, right? So they don't enhance more inflammatory response. And then that involves all the players that are subsequent to that. Cytokines, pro and anti-inflammatory, chemokines, pro and anti-inflammatory, growth factors, transcription factors, all that becomes corrupted as we age because of the vagaries of living in the environment, making choices as an agent. The free will aspect is what drives this interaction. That's what I'm showing by these arrows. Driving interaction between the genome, the environment, and the neuroepigenome. Ultimately, this leads to a dynamic. And this dynamic enhances the incorporation of more and more morbidities. And those morbidities lead ultimately to the correct linkage of morbidities to major systems failure 
major systems failure, which we observe as a person ages, such as ambulation, such as somatosensory ability, such as cognitive ability. Ultimately, those morbidities have underlying pathobiochemical, pathophysiological networks that are failing within this aging diaventone, this dynamic system, and it comes to an end. And then my ultimate dis discussion would be ending on that note. Aging is a chronic disease that ultimately leads unto death. And here are some of the components of the aging diaventone. So we're done with over a year of arc of lectures. Hopefully you've learned something from here, from these lectures I've done both on the audio and far less of them, of course, on the video. This will be the last one I'm doing on aging until I pick it up again. If I ever pick it up again, maybe I will write a review article from all these lectures. I'm planning on that. Probably not a book, but a good long review article or two. <clears throat> and of course, I didn't even discuss in great detail lipids today, but you know, it's going to have a heavy emphasis on lipids. Uh, but the next set of lectures we're going to start on, I'm going to surprise you with. I'm not going to tell you what it's about right now, but please keep following both Authentic Biochemistry, the podcast, and my YouTube channel. Again, this is Dr. Dan Guerra, hoping you have a really good Christmas with your family, a good, healthy um, interaction with the ones you love. And you know that that's the most important thing is that. So this is Dr. Dan Guerra, again, from Authentic Biochemistry Studios, uh, on the last lecture on aging, where... Um, I don't regret saying um, bye for now. And I will see you soon.